kind of oh. talk about what your your subject is and and why you have a passion for this and just kind of walk us through what we're going to do. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Mike Kristoff. I'm a, I'm a transplant. I'm not a Utah native. Um, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Ohio, graduated from the high street university with a degree in graphic design and a minor in photography. And um, <clears throat> I've just been, um, I, plus I'm a, I'm a Mac, I'm an Apple fanboy. So I've been a fanboy since 92. Um, <clears throat> and so that kind of puts a date on my head, how old I am. So I'll let you figure that out. Um, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I moved out to Utah about six years ago um, for a job. And I love it out here. I love the, the outdoors. Um, uh, up until maybe two years ago, I've been shooting everything on my phone. Um, I decided to go back and brush off my DSLR skills, or my, my knowledge. So <clears throat> if you look at my Facebook or if you look at my Instagram page, you'll see that the most recent photographs are DSLR. But anything prior to last year are uh, smartphone pictures. Um, I'm sharing with you guys the things that I've learned over the years using my iPhone. Um, I started doing iPhone photography with the iPhone uh, 4S um, and just gradually increased up. And I've kind of stuck and stayed with my iPhone 8 Plus. Um, I just think that's the best camera so far. And um, my photographs have been published on a group called Mobiography. They're out of London, England, and they, they focus primarily on mobile photography. Um, I was interviewed by the iPhone Photography School <clears throat> on landscape photography. And I, the first year I was out here in Utah, I won honorable mention at the Nature Conservancy photo contest. And that was a photograph of what I call moody, moody mother nature. And it was uh, the Great Salt Lake after a, a May storm. So <clears throat> I just wanted to share with you guys some of the things that I know about photography, um, just your basic photography principles and methods on how to take good composition in photography. And then I'll introduce you to some of the tips and tricks on your phone and how you can access and take some some candid pictures um, and some gear, some extra gear that you can add to your camera. Um, wide angle lens, macro lens, and tripod. Okay. So I'll share with you my screen. Any questions before I start? Okay, so I'm going to help you guys understand how you can take photos that nobody will even believe that you shot them with your iPhone or your smartphone camera. With the raise of hands, who knows about the rule of thirds? Okay. On, on everybody's phone in their settings, you can set up a grid within your, on your smartphone that helps you, um, I don't know if you can see, there's like a, an outline of thin white lines. The rule of thirds, um, it's very simple. You divide the frame into nine equal rectangles. And with the help of that grid that's on your phone, it'll, it'll help you even better to see where to line up your photograph. Um, this picture was taken at Utah Lake that first winter I got here. Uh, no, this is Deer Creek, I apologize. And um, I was able to walk out on the lake and there's the frozen buoy in the, uh, in the lake. And I thought it was kind of funny because it says no, no wake slow. Um, <clears throat> but what you do is you, fo you focus on a piece of information in your, in your composition where you want to align your focal point, your eye of focus in that photograph. Um, 
amongst one of the crosshairs of that grid. So for me, I stuck that bit of information, that buoy, that frozen buoy, a little bit off center um, because I found that the, the upper two thirds of the photograph were a little bit more interesting than the bottom third with the, the, the cloud formations. And so, yeah, so you just, you place that important, you in place, place your important elements within the grid. So it can be anywhere within this, this section here, 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 off center, dead center, or bottom. And also horizontally, like if there's more interest in the sky than there is in the foreground, then you can use the upper two thirds of your frame on your camera, on your phone, sorry. <laughs> you can use the upper two thirds to, to, to balance your, your composition of your photograph within that grid. Angles. <clears throat> Changing your angles in your perspective not only gets you a better shot, it also shows how you see the subject. So um, I think all of us might be prone to getting down low on the ground, laying on our bellies, or being underneath things that we're not supposed to be underneath, but because we want to get that good shot. So um, <clears throat> for a while there, I worked for the church, and I had a commute by front runner and tracks from, Pro, from Orem all the way down to Salt Lake. And so I think this is around Christmas time and I was just goofing around and I thought, you know, let's just, let's switch it up and flip it on a funny angle. So <clears throat> in that way, when you play with angles, you get a sense of movement into your photograph. Um, you know, downtown city life is busy and it's fast and there's a lot of action. So by finding different types of angles by flipping your phone into different ways to get that sense of motion and activity. Change it, just change your point of view. Because if, if this picture was taken normally, then I think it would just been another normal photograph that you're taking down, downtown on State Street. So. This is everybody's favorite time of year, time of day is the golden hour. Um, this, you know, morning golden hour is not really my favorite because I can't get up in time, but, um, evening golden hour, I'm already, I'm already awake, but because I took the train a lot and I had to, had to be at Temple Square at eight o'clock, I had to get up super early. So winter time, I'm on the train and the lights coming in from the, from the right hand side. So it kind of causes that juxtaposition of hot and cold because it's warm in the car, but it's cold outside. So you've got those two elements of light happening. Um, it, I don't think I need to explain a little bit more about the, ha the, the happiness of golden hour, but it, it, it gives you some of the soft, delicate shadows in the morning and these long, warm shadows in the evening. Centered composition. There are times when placing the subject in the center of the frame works really well. Symmetrical scenes are perfect for centered compositions. And plus it helps people feel grounded because everything is just, just right and, and just so. Um, this is the building formerly known as the South Visitor Center on Temple Square. Um, it's no longer. They they torn it down for the for the restoration and remodel of Temple Square. But this is just looking through that those glass panels. But then you'd have those glass pieces on the side that divided the window. And I just found it interesting to stick the temple in between those two pieces of glass. Interest uh, foreground interest. One of the biggest hurdles in photography is the fact that our, our three-dimensional scenes render a mere two, they become two-dimensional 
when we when we look through the viewfinder, but adding something in the foreground to give interest that you're you're close to it, then you can that you know that gives you that illusion of depth. So you know there's something in front of you, and then you can look out into the distance. Um, <clears throat> this is the state line between Utah and Nevada at uh, Window Rift, back road, cattle grade. <clears throat> Am I going too fast or you need to slow down? Fast, John, okay. Okay. Um, I'm an avid, I came out here from Ohio, highest elevation, Ohio is 900 feet. Um, that's where I grew up was 900 feet elevation, the highest point in Ohio, to Orem, Utah, where elevation is 47,000, 4,785 feet or something like that. So um, <clears throat> the day that I moved here was in mid-August. I'm like, I need to get out there in those mountains and check these things out. So um, ever since then, I, I, I hike year round. I've got the gear. I've gone from hiking with a a feathered down jacket to now this really lightweight piece of equipment that's not going to make me hot and sweaty. Um, <clears throat> but um, you can think of setting up, if you, if you have something interesting in the foreground, it just sort of, it, it anchors your photograph. It anchors the viewer in the photograph. Um, and so this, rock formation in the front sort of just sort of invites you in farther. So I always try to find these interesting bits of foreground to add into my photographs or into my compositions because I want to ground the, the user or ground the viewer into my photograph and I want to invite them in to start looking around and seeing different, you know, shadows, different lines, different textures, different colors. So always find foreground interests, you know, help you improve the depth and quality of your image. Frame within a frame. A frame in the, in the frame is, is also another technique for portraying depth. Um, you can you can look, you know, use windows, like I use the framing of the, of the, the, the visitor center windows of the temple, um, an overarching tree branch, um, open door, car door, car window, um, anything that's just gonna give the, the viewer a sense of belonging or a sense of being in the image as well. Um, and the, the frame doesn't necessarily have to surround the entire scene to get that effect. I mean, you could have that tree could have been broken halfway through and it still would have framed, but I went all out and got the whole tree bridge. <clears throat> Leading lines. Um, this is out going out towards Goblin Valley, the road that takes you out there. Um, I tend to, I'm, I'm in, I've, I've fallen in love with, with Utah in the, the Intermountain West because of the vast openness of the country and just, just the grandness and having <clears throat> anything that a line or a path or a trail or a stream or a sidewalk or a set of stairs that help. Because we as photographers, we're storytellers. We're telling a story through our photographs. And so we want to tell the story of, of, you know, in this composition where it's this grand, open, big space. But I want to lead my, the people who are looking at my photographs in into the picture. So this straight bit of road is just leading you directly into this space right here. <clears throat> so that's leading lines. 
diagonals and triangles. So just a question, how close yeah. to the road did you have to get for that oh, previous oh. picture? I'm, I'm, I parked my car and I'm standing outside of my sunroof. So you're not oh. even down on the road in this one. No, I'm, I'm in, I have a Mini Cooper, so I'm about four, five feet off the ground. Well, I like your leading lines. I just wondered how close. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I, I, I'd like to have questions as I'm going through so I understand that people are following. So if there's any other questions, just please pipe in. I don't, I don't want to dictate, so. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, <clears throat> diagonals and triangles, dynamic tension. Um, I like that word. Um, horizontal lines and vertical lines, they suggest just stability. But once you introduce something that's not a stable line that's sort of against, then that causes friction in your photographs and a sense of, um, I don't know, it's just like, in this picture in particular, it, 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 it re-enhances the mood because there's this crazy storm that's brewing. This is uh, Knoll's recreation. Um, I spent the whole day going out to um, Wendover and because it, it was raining and pouring in Salt Lake. And I said, I just want to get out of the rain. So I went out west to the west, west desert. But, um, <clears throat> but this, you know, this introduction of trying to find diagonals and triangles in landscape, it just helps to um, in, increase and then get that message of that you want to create some sort of instability or mood or tension. In the <clears throat> this is uh, out at Willow Lake up in uh, Big Cottonwood Canyon. And every time I see this picture, I always think of that song, one of these things is not like the other. Um, <clears throat> we as humans are attracted to patterns. Um, me in particular, I'm very attracted to patterns. I, I'm attracted to natural patterns. And in my, my day job, I'm attracted to uh, verbal patterns. So, um, <clears throat> Incorporating patterns into your photography is always a good way to create a pleasing composition. But the best is when you interrupt that pattern, is when you, it's like, I don't know, just like, ta-da. So it, as you're walking in nature and, you know, like here, it's the, the aspirin grove, always try to find something that can break that pattern that adds that interest into your composition. Rule of odds. The rule suggests that an image is more visually pleasing if there are an odd number of subjects. The theory proposes that even the even number of elements in a scene is distracting as the viewer is not sure which one to focus on. So by adding an extra one, then that pleases the viewer. It's like, okay, so I now I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this big one in the foreground, this one in the midground, this one in the background. But this one's kind of misleading because there's there's another one in the back background. But um, in the <clears throat> but you don't see that one until you start investigating the photograph. If I would have <clears throat> just done a photograph of just these two wheels, then you would say, well, which one is more important? Or it wouldn't be as pleasing because it's also incorporating a leading line because of that. I don't even know what these are. I still don't know what these are. Um, but it, it, that line that they're all connected to just leads you all the way down into this section of the mountains in the background. <clears throat> and this is out a photograph taken out near um, Goshen at the Sinclair gas station. <clears throat> it's really funny because I, I, these photographs, I remember my memories and I remember my outings and this is the day 
think it was in the early beginning parts of the spring and those ditches were not completely solid. And I came home with wet knees, up, wet clothes up to my knees because that snow wasn't solid. So that is why I a photographer. <clears throat> Change your point of view. Um, most of us take photographs when we're out and about in our, with our phones, we take pictures like this. We're just like going around and we're taking pictures of family and we see a pretty sunset. We see a pretty mountain or a curve on the road and we just go, oh, I gotta take a picture and snap and take a picture. But um, getting up or getting low can help create an interesting or original composition of a familiar subject. So people on Temple Square, they usually either run to the front of the building where the reflecting pool is and take a picture of the temple by the getting a reflection or trying to dodge people to get your perfect picture of the reflection pool. Or you run around the other side and you try to get your composition with the tabernacle with the temple. But <clears throat> because me, I just, I do things that you're not really supposed to do. Um, I kind of went over is if you're walking in on Temple Square from the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, you walk through that gate. There's um, what used to be the South, the South Visitor Center. There was that giant um, cypress tree. As you walk in, you turn to the right. There's like a, this little fence. I kind of I stepped over it, walked gingerly as possibly so I wouldn't damage anything. But I stood right against the the, the wall. And there is a like a like a mechanic building. I stood right next to that, and I just got at a low angle, and I looked up through the trees to get the temple in this perspective. So, <clears throat> if anything else, the takeaway from this uh, little presentation is: don't settle for taking just a normal picture with your phone. Slow down a little bit and get those different angles. If it requires getting on your knees, maybe sometimes on your belly. Um, it, if, you're, if you're persistent and you're, you persevere, then you can find these little gems on Temple Square or anywhere that you go, just by changing your point of view. <clears throat> now, this one is I didn't know was a rule, um, but it's the rule of space. Um, the rule of space relates to the direction the subject and your photo are facing or moving towards. You take, like for example, this moving train. The train is moving into the, into the space to the left. So this implies that the space, there's a space in the frame for the train to move into. So we can, we can, we can mentally imagine the train moving into a space. So the rule of space, I you know, it works with with um, urban landscape photography or urban photography. Um, I'm not quite sure if it works for landscape photography. If there's a mate, something moving into a space, maybe an animal moving into space, or people hiking on trails moving into a space, because um, people can give you a sense of scale as well especially in landscape photography here in Utah, that, you know, adding, even though you don't want that person in your space, um, you can work it into the composition by maybe following this rule of space into this rule of space by that person coming down the trail. So he's coming down the trail and he's filling in that space if this was a bounce and coming into it or leading out of it. Um, <clears throat> color theory was another thing that I studied in college because I studied to be, a, I was a graphic designer was my major. Um, and color theory, like I showed you that photograph of the woman on the train, you've got warm colors competing against cool colors. Um, so it's always good to look for those moments where you can find those color combinations that are pleasing, those complementary colors. Um, <clears throat> they complement each other. And so this woman 
I arrived at the Capitol with a friend and we we're taking photographs and I was all excited and I was gonna take these nice interior photographs and then a, a busload of foreign people arrived for a tour. And this young lady, I stood there for maybe 10 minutes and go, okay, she's gonna move. She's really gonna move. She's gonna move. Any moment now she's gonna move, but she never did. So I, I just snapped the photograph. But to me, because she's, it, it, you know, the rule of thirds, if you chop it in there, the two thirds are the, are the stairs. And she's kind of stuck there on that lower quadrant. And she, if she, was gone, I don't think it would have made the composition. It would have made the comp composition less interesting. So Mike, go ahead. Mike, I just wanted to add, I think her shadow really draws your eye in. The, her shadow. Yep. It's, it's wonderful photo. When that, all these photographs I've been showing you have been shot on my iPhone. These are all iPhone photography pictures, and I can show you how to get these types of um, imagery. I just wanted to build a foundation of composition. So as you have an understanding of composition, you can go out and use the techniques and take better photographs. Thank you, Barbara. And then those subtle moments that you can capture. Um, Beauty is found in this subtlety of life just as much as it can be found in the supreme extravagance. So always be prepared for those little moments. Um, he's my muse, he's my shadow, he follows me everywhere. He's now 10 years old. This is Max. Uh, Barbara had the, the, the fun to, to meet Max who thinks that there's dinosaur DNA in the ice in Utah Lake. <clears throat> maybe he'll become that scientist who can recruit the dinosaurs in the future. But um, he, I always have my phone ready. Um, if I don't have my big camera, I'll just have my little one and I can just take pictures of him. But those subtle moments are, are priceless. Um, being, able, being able to have a phone in your pocket or a, oops. Having a photograph, having a camera in your pocket at all times to capture those memories in those moments. So now, if there's any uh, before I get to the next section, if there's any questions, what I just went over, please feel free to ask away. Okay. Simon. Does it have to be an iPhone? Nope, it doesn't. Oh, good. No. <laughs> No, I think in, in the in the Android phones that there are settings in your phone, in your general settings where you can turn on the grid. But these all these composition um, techniques can go for your, your cell phone and can even go for your DSLR cameras. Mike? Yeah. Um, how did you turn the grid on? I didn't catch that. Okay. I'm going to go into my... It's in your settings. Oh, on the phone, not in the, in the, okay. Yeah, in the phone itself, you have to go into your settings and it's under um, photo, where's photo, where's camera? It's under your camera settings. Camera settings. Oh, I, yep. under camera settings. Oh, okay, and so you can turn grid on. Yep, you can turn your oh, grid on. Oh, okay. So then using the rule of thirds, you can, adjust your, your, your screen and your phone to match those, that rule. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. Rule number one, always clean your lens. Because <laughs> little things get inside that that camera into the, onto that little eye right there. So I always just take the corner of my t-shirt or the corner of my shirt, whatever I'm holding and I clean the lens because you'll get that, you'll finally get that right light and you get that right composition and you go home and you're thinking, why is it so foggy? I don't understand why it's so foggy. And then you realize, oh, there's a fingerprint on my, 
on my screen, on the eyeball of your camera. So same thing goes for DSLR, just make sure that your lens is always clean, right? Um, <clears throat> so when I'm take, okay, I'll take this, I'm gonna take a picture of you guys. So, oh, I'm not gonna work with my screen. Let me turn my screen off. Anyways, um, okay, right. Let me get closer. When you want to focus, there you want to touch. Um, there's within on your phone. Gosh, I didn't. I didn't test this before I, I started the the meeting. Um, hold on. I'm going to play some background music as I turn off my my Zoom background. This is so embarrassing. Um, I know it's a beautiful lake back there. Yeah, uh, preferences. I think we've been to that lake, Nida. It was on the way to Wall Lake. It's after trial. Okay, how do we? We didn't have snow, and I'm that is not a complaint. <laughs> Here, I look at myself. But um, you set the focus on your subject if you always want it to be sharp. Because people think, oh, I'm just going to take a picture with my phone and it's going to be in focus. Um, it does auto focus automatically, but if you really want to make sure that you're focused, focusing your, your subject, you just touch. You touch the screen. If you touch and hold the screen, See that yellow? Can you guys see that yellow part? Mm -hmm. That tells you that you just locked that focus in that section. So that's already auto locked focus. So when you take your photograph and your picture on your phone, then everything's gonna be in focus. So, and then that also helps you with your exposure. So, a lot, I've noticed a lot of my friends, they'll just say, oh, check out that sunset, and they'll take a picture on their phone. But then when they go back to look at it, they're like, oh, man, the sky's blown out. Or, how, you know, what I, it's not what I thought, it's not what I remembered. So how, how can I take it? So if you do that again, you touch, it's like the, with your grid on, you can have the upper part the lower part of exposure and the bottom part. This is not really changing because the, the light's all the same. When you go outside and you play with this, you can no, you'll notice that um, sometimes this set middle, oh, there you go, that's overexposed, see the background overexposed, and the upper part is getting there. So you find an area of focus on your phone or area of exposure that you want, and then you click and hold, and then find it. there's a little there's a little sunshine. You see that little sunshine icon next to the square? There, see that little sunshine? It's next to your phone. Oh, it went away. Right there. That little sunshine will will decrease your exposure again. and it will increase your exposure is that on a that you have an iphone right i don't think i have that on my android yeah we do do we yep i do i do oh i just don't know how to use it oh there it is okay yeah i found it thanks so yeah so when you're out taking photo what i use rule of thumb for me on my phone is that because your phone takes photographs and your phone flat, flattens your images. So in order to get those details back in post-production, it's the same as, as if you have a DSLR, you underexpose just a little bit so you can capture all the detail. And then when you go back in your post-editing, you can draw those details out by 
increasing the exposure, increasing the detail, increasing whatever. So I always go out, rule of thumb for me is I always make sure that I decrease a little bit of the exposure down and then I take the picture. So that helps with, with taking pictures post. Does that make sense? Can everybody Same. figure out how to do that on their phones by decreasing the exposure? So that means your photo will be a little bit on the darker side? Mm hmm it'll be on the darker side. Okay. But that, because you're helping, you're helping the, the, the phone, because if you, I mean, it's the same with the SLR. If you take a photograph and it's overexposed and you can't, there's no details to pull out. And post well, and you, you can't make it darker, right? But if it's too dark, you can make it brighter, right? Exactly. So you okay. can go backwards when you go into, into production of your pictures. So under underexpose your pictures on your phone. So when you go back to edit, you all those details are there. You just have to discover them through editing. Okay. Okay, I know the Android has the burst mode, but each phone is different. Um, let me show you some pictures that I took of the burst mode when I was in Oregon. Um, First, let me show you a video of what I was trying to capture. And I'll tell you the story about why my wife and my daughter laughed at me to where I was standing. <laughs> so um, this is a picture of a place called Thor's Well on the Oregon coast. I know Thor's Well. And it's... Um, big hole in the lava in the lava flow at the at the beach and there's a cave underneath so the waves come in they crash and the water flies up in the air and it, it's just so um silly me oh there's a picture there you go water comes flying up i was standing on the opposite side so they're standing on the north side i'm standing on the south side and we have a wind coming from the north so um <laughs> There's no proof that I got wet, but I did because it was, they have a thing called sneaker waves where these waves just, you don't think they're gonna be big, but they are and they come out of nowhere and they, they get you. So it was a bright sunny day and I thought, I thought the rain and the wave would never stop because it kept dumping on me. But after I dried off, and I went back to the right side of the pole as well, I decided to use my burst mode. So my burst mode helps you take um, motion, but it, it takes frames after frame after frame. And then you can go back in your photographs and you can pick which frame you want to edit. So this is the show in your, your burst mode. So there's like, I was looking, Oh, I don't want that one, but I was looking for the right photograph to kind of show you that wave coming through the, the well. So with, um, with the iPhone and in your, inside, your, um, inside your library of your pictures, you let me find a burst so I can show you how to access it. Okay. In, in, on the iPhone, in your photo album, if you take a, a burst mode, in burst mode photograph, I'll show you how to do burst mode, but this is where you find it. You're, you'll have a photograph and then you have like a frame at the bottom that looks like a, like a movie frame at the bottom. When you hit the, hit the word select, it opens it up and you can go through and select which, what frame you want. So I want that frame. So when you say that's the one you want, and you say done. You can keep everything, or you can just keep the one. So if you don't want, if you look through all of them, you don't want any of them, but you just want one, then you can just keep one. But in order to take a burst mode photograph on your iPhone, 
I don't know. I think there's a setting on Android that didn't make sense to me because I don't have an Android. But you're taking a picture on your cell phone. You touch and hold the button. And you just hold it until, like, for example, the wave was going through its wave phase. I would just go from the beginning to the end, and I would stop. I don't know if you can tell how it happens over here. See the picture changing on the right hand side? Multiple, 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 multiple. So you go back in to your, your pictures in your photo album. Back, back. I can hit select and I can choose which frame I want. They're all going to be the same, but. This, this, helped, this worked really well when we were in North Carolina and the seagulls were, come, were joining us on the ferry across the sound and they were, we were feeding them bread and they would come flying down. And so you can do a burst mode real quick, an action picture, and then you can pick which one of the action of the birds or the waves or anything that's in motion that you can capture on your phone. Any questions on that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm not on mute. I got a video just holding the center button down. How do you get the burst mode again? You you showed it and I was watching my video. Okay. Can you go back? Is that night Yeah. Okay. And I'm an Android. You're on an Android. So on the hmm. I'm gonna look into what how to do it on the Android. Um it was like if you open your your camera um, on the iPhone, you just hold you hold the um, shutter button. I held the shutter button and it made a little movie, but it's showing it as a movie. Then do well, you can, can you go, the can you go, in, can you go you? to your photo wherever your photographs are? So, or, or There's a or? gallery, right? And then go pick a frame. Can you pick a frame in your gallery? I'm still seeing a movie. Okay. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look into that for everybody. Yeah, that one's different. Because that's really handy when you're taking motion pictures. You're trying to capture that one, like if you're trying to capture your your grandson and your son. Hey, mom, look at me! I can jump up, and I'm gonna do this crazy. Yeah, that would be cool. jumping in the middle of the air and then you try it on your phone and he's like halfway down or. But it stopped after six seconds. So it sounds like it's what you're doing, but it, mm -hmm. I just don't see where you see the. I'll get back to you on that one. Okay. Okay. Um, did you know that I don't have them with me, but if you stick those headphones that come with your phone, it's, it works on the iPhone. It might work on the Android. You can go cognito and become a spy because you stick your headphones into your head, into your iPhone, like you're listening to music, but the volume buttons act as the shutter re release speed. Did you know that? So what? You can, Say that again. You stick your headphones into your into your phone like you're going to listen to music. Yeah. But if you use the vol, if you as you're listening to, then you flip to your to your camera mode on your phone. Then you use the volume buttons, and it acts as a shutter release. Wow, I would have to try that. So hey, can I interrupt? Yes. Um, I think on my Android once I I was touching the sound, you know, I accidentally touched the sound and took a hundred burst mode photos. So maybe I, I need to try that. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you can take a burst mode is with your sound button. Right. Well, that's cool. But I'm not sure. <laughs> this we'll this, try it when we get off. Here, this guy was right, this guy was right in front of me on the tracks and he, I don't know what he was reading. Looks like wallpapers or something, but I was pretending to read the news on my phone, but I had my headphones on and I was just learning la di da, la di da, click, 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 click. 
and I, I got him in mid yawn, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and again, with this guy, he, this homeless man, he's on the train and he was this, the way he was looking out the window, you know, so you can go cognito mode on your phone if you want to capture like street photography and you want to get those moments where they're not, you know, paying attention. You just want those real moments. So you can just use your headphone jack, stick your earbuds in and just play with that volume control and take pictures. Um, I think HDR, there's a mode for your pictures that you can do HDR mode. And that helps a lot. When you're, um, it's also in settings, in your phone, your camera settings in your phone, you can set to HDR mode. And that helps you capture that high dynamic range of, you know, your, your camera, your phone will adjust for the overexposed, underexposed, and the medium exposure picture, and then they'll put them together. And that kind of helps to enhance those sunset pictures or those landscape morning pictures. So you can get that that definition of range. Are you gonna make your notes available afterwards? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I can I can share this deck with you all. No problem. Thank you. Um, um let's see. So I did that, did that, did that. HDR mode. Um I'm gonna show you some of the things that I use that I swear by now. Um, I've used various types of clip-on equipment, like clip-on lenses and clip-on um, um, wide-angle lenses, macro lenses. I've bought them from the ones that were $9.99 on Amazon all the way to maybe 50 bucks. But I had always, food and odd about this company called Moment. Um, and I never really wanted to pay the price for their uh, equipment. But um, I did it a couple years ago during Thanksgiving when they're having the Black Friday sale. And the, the case that I have, it's a Moment case. And it has these grooves in the back right here. Um, if you hold, I'm going to do intermission real quick because I forgot to bring my lens downstairs. I'll be right back. Snack break. Everyone go get food. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Roger. It's so good to see you. Well, I'm not. Let me see if I can see you. I can hear you. Oh, I'm in gallery mode. So I've got the side by side with the main camera and then I can still see faces on the side. Oh, I see you now. Okay. Hi. How, how are you? What it's been? 30 years? Yeah. It's yeah. been a long time. <laughs> see you. Okay. My, ma my macro lens is somewhere on the beach in Oregon. Mm. All in my pocket. So the ocean claimed my lens. And took oh, my, no. Took my $129. So, but I'll, I'll get it again because I'm. I'm, uh, I swear by these. So here is my wide angle lens. And what you do, you just take them out of the, you just pop it on your, your case. Oh. And now your phone and your camera is equipped to work as a wide angle lens. Oh, nice. Um, wide angle lens. If you go, sometimes if you go to their um, used in open boxes or their garage sale location, you can get them for like 80 bucks. Um, well worth it. I can take a before and after of a, you gain about, in the frame itself, you gain about, uh, five or six feet on either side of your frame with the wide angle lens compared to just taking a photograph with your phone. And this works for Android and for iPhone. So, so that's the wide angle lens that I use. And then I also use my 
ND filter. It's a filter that, that, you know, it helps cut out the glare, like on sunsets and, and water, the glare on reflections, on glass, um, and it also enhances the sky. So this only works kind of finicky. I have to take, I have to take it apart, put the back on, oops, right there, and then just stick this back on. And now you have an ND filter on the, on your phone and it, it enhances your, uh, your sky, your, the light makes everything more vivid, more rich. And if I get any discounts for a moment, then I'd say go for it, but I probably don't. But <clears throat> really rule, it's the best investment I made. These are super handy. <laughs> and you can, you can even combine the wide angle with the ND filter. You just have to take the back off and stick the wide angle back in there. And then you can get the wide angle with the ND filter. I don't think, I think, I don't know, that was just my trick. Um, and then because I hike a lot, I have this bendy little tripod. Um, his, all the tripod legs are all bendable, they all bend. Um, so if I'm trying to take a group shot of my hiking buddies and we're in a funny spot where like you, <laughs> there's nowhere to put the tripod, then I'll just take his arms and I'll wrap them around a tree. And then it comes with this handy dandy little remote and you can just remote and shoot. Um, and it also helps with taking, um, you can do, there's a couple apps I can share with you guys afterwards. What, um, what apps do I have? What's it called? Um, Pro Camera is an app for, I think it's for Android and for um, Apple. And that helps you, it kind of works as like a, a miniature DSLR. You can set, um, over, you can do like long exposure photographs, but you need a tripod for that. So you just have to make sure that you, you know, set your phone up if it's, so I know phones right now, they still take good photographs at low light, but with Pro, Pro Camera, it opens up the, the shutter a little bit more on your phone and it gets a little bit it gets rid of that, um, those artifacts that you get. If you take a low light photograph, you get really pixelated pictures. But with, uh, with one of these little handy little tripods and this, this pro camera app, you can get some uh, over, you know, long exposure photographs. And I'll make these links available too if anybody wants to go out and purchase anything. Um, I just wanted to share with you before we close tonight of the places that I have been published. I, 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 don't, I don't want this part to come out like braggish. I just want to share with you uh, to give you tips. Uh, this company reached out to me on Instagram and they wanted to do an interview on what tips I can help for landscape photography on, on an iPhone or an Android. So I'll share this link out, but you know, that I was able to uh, give kudos to Utah and its landscape, but through the interview, they asked questions. Um, shoot at the moment, sunsets are the most, how to capture dramatic skies, um, stuff like that. And then because I started, I started before Instagram became a thing and then Instagram came around and I got really excited. I thought, well, this is a great time to share photographs with the other photographers. Um, and I got, I got really involved. I, I worked for a startup company that was using Instagram as, um, as campaign promo for photographers. Um, but I got into mobile photography really heavy and there's this group, I, I mentioned this group out of London called Mobiography. And they do, if you're ever on Instagram, they'll, they'll throw out a weekly challenge. Like they'll say, urban photography, landscape photography, simplistic photography challenge. And they'll just ask you to tag your photograph. And it has to be mobile pictures. Um, 
or Android pictures, it can't be DSLR photographs, and they pick the top 10, and I got selected a couple times. Um, and this one is another incognito shot where I had my headphones on, and um, this is the Murray, the Murray track station. Everybody's getting out to the hospital, getting off the train, getting on the train. And this guy was reading something on his phone, but being able to use that, you can do the burst mode as well on your on your incognito. You just hold down the volume button and you just get like a burst mode. And I just went through the ones that I found that were interesting in the background of everybody getting on the train. Um, and then this was um, challenge number 43 for beautiful nature inspired photographs using the phone. And here, here again is just another example of changing your perspective. Um, I, was, I was laying on the ground um, in a bed of fern bushes, just looking up at the aspens. Um, and then this was, I think, the simplicity challenge that they had. And this is just at the, the sun had just set. It's uh, the salt flats. And um, just the way I composed it, just the simplicity of that photograph. So that is it, what I have. Any questions? Uh, Mike, question? you had indicated you wanted us to download Snapseed. Are you gonna talk about that oh, a little yeah. bit? Let me show you that real quick. That's on my deck. I can show you the before and after on Snapseed on how that Lays out. Where's my? Oh, over here. Thank you for that. Okay. Snapseed. Post edit. Post production. All right. In Snapseed, did everybody download it? Or have it had? Who 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 has used it before? I use it all the time. It's a handy little app, isn't it? It's like a little, love it. little, little mini version of Photoshop in a sense. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I have a friend in the club, I won't say his name, but he will Dropbox his photos from his DSLR into Snapseed. Cause I don't think it's available for your computer, is it? No, I don't think so. I think it's only, it's only uh, mobile, a mobile app, but Lightroom that has now has a mobile app. I've got a I've got a search result here that says Snapseed for PC Windows. Oh, oh cool. Well heck. I see so on that Snapseed, can you just kind of briefly explain each of those little icons? Yeah. I mean I figured out a couple of them. I've only been playing with it for a couple of days, but sure. Some uh, of those I'm not sure of what they do or why. That's a good, I can do that right now. So I'm going to pull up a photograph in my little camera. I mean, I, I know the cropping that made sense, the focus one, uh, but some of those others, I, 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 I should probably call it up and then I'd. So the one that says tune image. In tune image, you can change the brightness, you can change the contrast, the saturation, the ambiance, the highlights, the shadows, and the warmth. So when you um, when you take a picture, this is I was out at Tibble just to show you guys. So you touch you touch the image. So I'm 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 in right now. I'm going to go in the tools. I'm going to go to tune image. Then you touch anywhere in the image and start swiping. Then the menu comes up. I think I'm in the wrong one. I'm in temperature. Hold on. Tools, tune. So there. So you can slide up and down that menu. So I'm gonna I'm gonna select um, saturation because that's just gonna. So then once you select saturation, you, then you go left and right on your image. So you desaturate it all the way completely, or you can oversaturate it to where you want. So 
up and down is where you select on the menu. You touch the image and you okay. go up and down, you get the menu. And then once you select what area you want to use the saturation exposure, then you slide left and right. So that's, that's tuning your image. I use that a lot. Uh, detail. So that grainy film, what is that grainy film? What does that do? Grainy film, that's like if you wanted it, like, okay, so tune image, details, curves, white balance, um, selective is like if you want to, if you want to make your photograph look what you thought it looked like with no artsy added to it. But then you get into um, like vintage and drama, um, glamour glow. Glamour glow is like, <laughs> Is like um, People Magazine. If you want to become like a People Magazine person, cover person, <laughs> then you can oh. use Glamour Glow, and it'll it'll take all your wrinkles and all your blemishes out, and it'll make you look like a teenager. <laughs> so if you want, yeah, us old people, if you want to get rid of those crow's feet and stuff, then you can use Glamour Glow. Um, the uh, curves. It just it's like what we use on. Anywhere else, you, you, you're changing your curves of your photograph, you're moving them up and down, changing exposures. Um, white, white balance is your, you've got your temperature and your tint. I never use tint, I never tint my photographs. Why would you wanna tint your pictures? I don't understand. But if you wanna, you know, change the temperature, if you want it to be a cool temperature or a warm temperature, you just slide it yeah. Right. What white balance is the same thing. Um, crop. You can crop your images. Um, you've got the proportions on the bottom how you want it. If you want a square proportion, you can do a square. If you want like yeah. three to nine, four to three, whatever proportion you want, you can make that crop. Um, another technique for cropping is like if you you want to remove things that are distracting to the viewer. So like in this picture, I wanna focus on the mountain, uh, a tympanogus in the background, but all this stuff in the foreground is, is not gonna enhance the picture, it, it, you can get rid of it. So in, when you're taking pictures as well, like if you wanna post on Instagram or post to Facebook and you wanna focus in on those areas that are more important, then I'll just go into the free crop and I'll start cropping out those areas that I really don't want at all. Because I want to focus on that, the mountain in the background. And so there, let's get rid of the noise. There's sometimes we take pictures real fast and we have a whole bunch of visual noise, but remember what you're trying to, what, what are you focusing on? What are you composing your photograph? And then in post edit, just get rid of all that stuff that you don't need and just go in and, and get rid of it and focus in on what you want. So um, rotate perspective, expand, I never use, but selective I use a lot. So here's an example. This is Temple Square. This is what you, what you shot with your phone, but you remember it looking much more vivid. And what our phone cameras tend to do is they tend to flatten your image. Um, so we need to give, we need to help out our pictures in the end by using these app, these post edit apps to bring out that information that kind of gets confused in this little camera's brain. So by using Snapseed, we can go in. So these are the, this is what I use. I use the selective tool, the tonal control, the tone image and the healing. What did I heal? I must have healed something. I healed, what did I heal? Healing is like, if you have an ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, ex-somebody, and you don't want them in the picture, then you can clone them out. No, just kidding. Um, if you have somebody walking in the scene, I, I must have used it for something to clone somebody out or clone something out. I can't see the difference of what I cloned out. Um, but that's what that tool is. You can go in and you can select the area that you want to delete, no, it's gonna bug me. It's like, what did I take out? But by using the selective tool, I'll show you the selective tool. Selective, in the selective tool, you touch an area. 
have to kind of do it sideways. So you select the area, and then when you expand it with your two fingers, you expand outwards. The area that's red, it's like, it's like putting a mask on your photograph in, in Lightroom. You're masking out the area that you want to focus on and you want to edit. So the sky and the mountain won't be touched, but the trees are going to be touched. That's the area that I'm going to edit. So with that selected, I can go in and I can, I can work on the structure of the image. I can work on the saturation of the image, the brightness and the contrast. So I can say, okay, I want to sharpen, I want to sharpen up those trees a little bit. So I'm going to play with the structure. And the structure is going to, overall, it's going to tighten up the sharpness of those trees a little bit. And then, and I use contrast a lot because I, because sometimes maybe it might be a little bit overexposed. So I want to bring the, 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 contrast down a little bit to give more you know, detail in the shadows. And then I might add a little bit of saturation. Like for example, here in the temple, these trees were a really vibrant yellow and the sky was a vibrant blue. And there was detail in this tree on the, on the left, there was some reds and oranges. So by using your selected tool, you can go throughout your picture on your phone and you can select out and you can bring out those colors. So you can bring out the yellows, you bring out the blue in the sky, the yellows in the tree, and that orange rusty color that was in the back. So that here, you, can really, you can't really tell. But I knew it was there, so I'll go in with my phone and I'll use that selective tool and I'll select certain areas of my picture and I'll use those, the saturation and the structure and the contrast to make those areas pop. So, and then the tonal, the tonal contrast, I wanted to give more, I wanted to get some detail to the sky. So by using, this is not a good example to show you tonal, but tonal contrast, you can, you play, you can play with the midtones, the high tones and the low tones, and then you can protect your highlights and you can protect your shadows. So here I'm gonna play, let's see, it shows, and see the different, let's see a different tree real quick. I don't have any, I don't have any clouds in this picture. But um, when you play around with clouds, you can see the difference. It'll start sharpening the midtones in those clouds and the, the shadows of the clouds and the highlights of the clouds, and it'll make them more detailed in the picture below. So you, you can use tonal, tonal image, and you can also use um, yeah, that was tonal contrast. That's what it was. Yeah, tonal contrast really works well when you have when you have clouds, and you want to you want to bring some detail in those clouds. Um, VSCO, visco. I don't know. That's what I call it. But if you want to get artsy, you want to be an artsy. You want to you know play around and be art class one hundred and one. The uh, VSCO loads with predefined filters that you can go through and add the filters to your picture. And then if you're like me and you don't like those, and they're only 99 cents, right? You just add another one for 99 cents and the next thing you know, you spend $20. But um, you can buy these predefined filters that you can add to your picture to get a little bit more artsy feel to it. And another app that I use, if I, if I have some pictures that I, I took at the wrong time of day, you know, you're not supposed to take pictures midday because you have really hard shadows and hard contrasting lines. They tell you that in, in school not to do midday, but you, you're out anyways. Um, so I use this fun little app called, um, uh, it's called Mextures, M-E-X-T-U-R-E-S, Mextures. And that's the same as VSCO, but I tend to use um, Mextures a lot. Here's an example. This is um, 
This is a photograph of an old barn on Highway 84 um, on the western edge of Oregon before you get to Idaho. Um, and I, I told my wife as we're driving out, I said, remember mile marker 314. So when we come back, we can stop at mile marker 314 and get this picture of this barn. Um, and I wanted, I, want, I thought, you know, that's going to look really nice, sort of artsy. So I went into, um, I went into next year's and I was able to play with, you know, the, a certain filters that gives you that sort of that rusty or purpley sky, but then the, the barn's a little bit more rustic and weathered because that picture to me just seemed to fit to be an artsy picture. Um, and you can just go in and pick a photograph. So here example, I picked, okay, it has, it has formulas. These are already predefined formulas within the app itself. You've got um, universal formulas, a mood romantic formula. Um, you've got landscape, black and white formulas. Um, the destroyed, if you want it to be like rustic and abandoned type stuff. Um, fall, winter. So you've got all these different uh, formulas. So I'm going to pick one. I'll pick the universal formulas. And at the bottom, you just have all these formulas that they, they are already put together. This is our lovely lady of uh, the Cottonwood County called Lake, uh, Lake Blanche. She's a temptress. She'll take you up there if you want to go see her during all the seasons of the year. Um, but you just touch on, on, on these uh, filters and it just automatically sets those presets to, uh, to whatever artsy mood that you want it to be. So that's a fun way to save midday photographs and turn it into something that's a piece of art. Yeah, so there's my muse. Um, these are some examples of um, the temple doors. Um, just change, you know, getting up close. Um, our friendly snail from Utah Lake in the, in the weeds. Um, some pictures of some of my hikes, you know, finding things, you know, here's your pattern, but then you find the oddball. This aspen just didn't want to go straight, so he's going to be a bit curvy. Um, so that kind of leads your eye into that, but then you also see this different type of light in the background. Um, the way that I see landscapes, I usually see landscapes like um, a play, like you have parts of a play, and you have the set design of a play, we have certain screens that overlay, give you a sense of depth. That's sort of how I see nature with these screens where you've got this, this foreground screen of grass, the mid screen of these aspens, and then the back screen of these maple trees in the back. Um, I like to play with light a lot, dramatic lighting. One of my, another one of my favorite, you'll see a lot in my compositions. Um, use of angles, funny angles. Yeah, that's me. Those photos are just beautiful. I'm way impressed with what you're able to, the detail and the color and the mood and everything. They're gorgeous. Well, that's because he uses an Apple computer or an Apple phone. No, no, Chris, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to convert them for a while. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> I, had, I had a buddy who was all Android and I taught him these rules. And then he's he's able to take the same. I mean, the the Google Pixel and the Samsung line seem to be really good competitors to the uh, the iPhone. So uh -huh. he's taking pictures just the same way. You know, just the certain techniques of composition, and then knowing knowing your phone and how to you know underexpose your picture to get to gain those details, and then exposing those details and shadow in your post-production. That's really cool. Um, listen, I've been doing a little bit of work on my computer in the background while you've been talking. And I found that in order to download apps, 
like phone apps on your computer because they don't have a Snapseed for Windows. But there was an instruction about downloading something called BlueStacks. And if you download BlueStacks, which I'm still trying to do, it's in its post installation steps. But if you download BlueStacks and you're supposed to be able to download phone apps like Snapseed and then use it on your desktop, on your oh, PC. Sweet. So it's a little more complicated than I thought, but I hopefully that's helpful. I'm trying to go through the process now. We'll see if it actually works. Cool. I expect a, 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 re, a review from you. But yeah, thank you. Um, so any questions or any feedback? I have a question. Go ahead. When I use Snapseed and I, you know, um, bring the texture up in the clouds, I can't seem to get rid of the noise it creates. I how do you get rid of noise in in a picture? The picture. Well, one you have to make sure that not. To, oh, it's still, okay. Sorry. Um, when you edit, when you start seeing that noise happen, just pull pull back a little bit. You know, I'm afraid that some not seeing you, but people in general tend to overuse the apps and they they go they get, maybe go a little bit too far. So when you start seeing that um, granularization or that pixelization of of an image, then just pull back, pull back a little bit because you don't you really don't need that much to add detail to a picture. Um, um, but then you can also use, I think there's a smoothing tool. When you say pull back, what are you meaning? The, the little sun that I see and pull that back so it's darker, so that it's underexposed? Is that what you mean by pull back or? I think uh, what I mean, but what Barbara's talking about is like she's using, she's in Snapseed and she's using the tonal, let me find a picture with, uh, with clouds because it works better with clouds. I, I gave you a picture of a blue sky. That was silly. Um, <clears throat> that's some clouds. There's some clouds. Okay, here we go. All right. Because it makes incredible clouds, I think. Yep. But they can be noisy. That's gorgeous. So this is Oregon coast. This is Cape Kawanda, huge sand dune that my wife killed me for making a walk up it, then finding out there's an easier route up. But anyways, that's beside the point. So when you go up to uh, tonal contrast, when I say um, pull back, so let's see if it works with what you're talking about. Okay, there you go. So there you go, midtones. I overdid it. So when you lower it down, hard to see on the phone. When you do too much, and it starts looking really grainy and it looks kind of, the edges are way too sharp. So when I say pull back, I mean to take, right now the midtones are at our 100%, that's too much. So pull back on it. So I'm saying pull back, find, find that spot where they're not gonna be overly defined. What are you doing? but defined enough to give that edge that you're looking for in the cloud. So, um, and for, to get rid of the graininess, um, there's a soft, there's a soften mode. Oh wait, where's grain? Where's grain? Grain, 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 where is it? Um, there we go, there we go. And the, there's a setting there. Here, let me go back because I don't know how I got there. Um, there. Whoops. Oops. Gosh, darn it. Okay. Just below glamour, there's a there's one that says grainy. You see it? It says what? Just below the the glamour glow on Snapseed, there's a there's an icon that says grainy. Right, grainy film. Yeah, and you can go in and you can you can reduce the grain. So you can go back and reduce the grain by pulling all the way to zero or pulling forward to 100%. So you can 
You can play around with various different types of um, filters and tweaks to get rid of the grain. But if you're getting, if your image is clear and then you start getting grain in your photograph, then you've used that particular tool. You you've overdone that, so you just have to go backwards. Like, like don't pull it, pull it to the point where you're going to get grain in the picture, but pull it back to where it goes back to the normal to what it was before you started adding that filter. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, the I see a lot of people they when they, they get excited about HDR and they go really nuts and they get these really strange looking photographs that aren't normal. Um, and to me that's that's not one not understanding the technique of what HDR is, <laughs> but then just sometimes people go too far to the point where you lose quality of your image. So um, when I go through these, these little things, I'll go back and forth and I'll do various bits and pieces, but I won't, I never really go all the way up to about 90, 80 or 90%. I usually play within my like 10, 20 and 30 range to add, you know, get that detail in the, in the clouds. That makes sense. I think we need a class just about Snapseed. That will take like... <laughs> But um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, send me a message. We'll, I, I can you know, pop on to, uh, to Facebook and we can do a, a live session or whatever. I'm always open to answer questions or help people out. So anything else? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. This has been Thank fabulous. You. Thank you. We all carry our phones with us. We do. And, and I know some of us get fairly frustrated when our phone takes a better picture than this big and expensive can. camera we're carrying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, usually, I usually have them both with me at the same time. Yeah, me too. Um, I, you know, sometimes I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna look really great on my camera. And then it looks like crap. But then I go to my phone, I'm like, oh, wow, that, that turned out really good. So I'll just use that one instead. But um, Apple, back in the day when they started promoting their, foot, their camera phone, they have done um, ad campaigns with iPhone, with phone photography, where they've created billboards that are three or four stories tall. So the quality is there. Um, back before I, um, before I moved to Utah, the, the Columbus Museum of Art uh, put together a, a curated show that was specifically built around mobile photography. So um, there's a, a leading photographer, his name is Kevin Kustner. Um, his, his background, he, he, he started as a photographer. He was a model photographer for, um, my boy, but he no longer is. He's on his own. He's doing all these um, non-profit things where he's helping third world countries get solar energy. But he he helped with the curation of the show. And then there's this other guy. His name is Josh Johnson. Um, at the time, he was an unemployed nurse practitioner, but he was also a photographer. And he was trying to figure out what he could do to build a community because Instagram just came out. And so he created this community called uh, the JJ community on Instagram. And he, J, uh, Josh Johnson and Kevin Kushner and the, the, the art museum put together um, a curated show where people submitted photographs of anything from like street photography to landscape photography to still life photography, all done on their phone. So, um, it was a great show. I learned a lot. Um, that's where I learned to, uh, to to always put quality images in, in, in my Instagram instead of quantity because quality outweighs quantity. So um, I, I went from 15, 2,000 photographs down to 600. So I make sure I just post what I think is good and I post on my Instagram. And I can share that with everybody too, if they want my Instagram feed, 
to see my, my work. So. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, just like we did last month, uh, I've created a, an album in our, on our club page. So now the challenge is go use your phone, go do your homework. He gave you some assignments, start posting on there and let's see what everybody comes back with. I'd love to see that. So yeah. it, it's under albums on the club page. It's, one, it's called mobile photography. And I'll put my deck in that folder. Perfect. And I'll put all the links to the, to the added equipment. Um, I can't, you know, if you've got your, your headphones, go cognito and take some, you know, incognito pictures of people. Now you got me nervous. <laughs> I hang out with some of these people. Uh, is there, is there any ethical problems with doing the incognito? I tend to take a lot of pictures of people and, and then I think, oh, I, I wonder if it's all right. <laughs> No, I, I'll never see that homeless person. I'll never see that guy on the train anymore. Um, yeah. I think there was one time I think she knew I was taking pictures of her, but she she didn't say anything. Um, it was her her boyfriend. It was the back of her boyfriend, and he had tattoos on his neck, like all over. His, you could just see him coming out of the shirt and and around. But she she was she was turned sideways, and she was. I think she knew I was taking pictures, but she didn't say anything. But it was a really cool picture. I Sounds mean, like fun. Most of what I have taken is with with the cell phone or mobile phone. So um, I don't have a big fancy camera. So <laughs> you don't need one, Roger. No, you don't. Well, yeah, no, I, it, it's really in the eye. It's the ability to see it, I think. And, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. the post work or the after work after you take the picture, that's where I'm kind of really green, just starting to learn a little bit about that kind of thing. So well, well, that's Roger, fun. If you want to do a one-on-one, -on -one, I can help you out. Or if anybody wants to do a one-on-one, -on -one, I can help them. I, I have to get a better setup on how to show you the how to work it. Or if we do a picnic, I can. I can you just do it through Zoom? Is that what you're thinking kind of thing or? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I have lots of questions. And of course, as you start to get into it, you want to show everything you've done, which which kind of gets boring for the other person. That's fine. Try, I don't try not to do that. That's okay. No, it's good. It's, it's all, good. all good. We'll we'll try and set up next month's meeting so that we're outside so we can get together. You know, like face to face, not screen to face. That sounds good. <laughs> so I'll be throwing on a poll probably in a week or two to get some ideas as to where you would like to go, but that'll be a great time to get people together and and talk our mobile photography, talk our flower photography and, and see where we wanna go next. But I think we're all ready to see people again. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, is there any, any other questions for Mike? This has been fabulous. This has been so good to learn. Very, very good. Yeah, it's awesome. I don't have any more questions, but thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. So I would wish everyone a good night. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording and then Sam will get this edited and he'll give us a link. So anybody that wants to rewatch, we'll post it on the club page and those who couldn't join us tonight can go back and watch it later. Okay. So we'll spread that word. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, I can't. I can't leave.